you may know Diana Larson. She's she's been around for a year or two and done a couple of things along the way. She co-authored uh, the Agile Retrospective book with Esther Derby. Phenomenal book if you if you haven't checked it out. Uh, it's one of those definitive go-to books um, that is a definitive resource in terms of facilitating and leading a, 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 an Agile Retrospective. Uh, team Liftoff, or I believe it's just called Liftoff with, um, um, shoot, I should have written this down, Ainsley Nice. Is that right? Ainsley um, Nice, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful book. One of those, one of those again, de facto standard books that is worth looking at. Uh, she is uh, the co-author of the Agile Fluency Project and the Agile Fluency Model with James Shore. Um, but tonight, we're here to talk about her most recent book, which is called Lead Without Blame, a book she co-authored with Trisha Broderick. So, Diana, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point to right. give us a quick talk on leading without blame. All right. It slides up here. All right, you might want to take a picture of this slide. <laughs> um, I'll show it again at the end, but um, just to let you know, I am going to go through this pretty quickly. So if you'd like to get your own excerpt from the book, just to, to see what it's like uh, before you decide whether to buy it or not, um, you can, I will send you an excerpt along with a 30% off discount code uh, if you'd like. And uh, you can also, um, if you'd like, join my new mailing list. So um, send your request to onward at dianalarson.com if, you, if you'd like that. So let's, whoops, do that again. So Lead Without Blame. Um, this new book is um, part of the, my series of books. It's the newest one. And it um, is, continues my focus uh, that's kind of been throughout my career, that, that uh, communication model on the, far, on the far left there is a, a model I created in the 1990s. And then the retrospective is in, you know, in the early 2000s and liftoff and so on. So all through all of these books, there is an emphasis on great leaders impactful learning and great teams. And um, some of them have more of one and some have more of the other. What I am really uh, proud of with this most recent book is that it encompasses all three of those themes. And so I'm pretty excited about sharing it with all of you. Uh, wrote it with Trisha Broderick and some wonderful people have said some very nice things about it. Um, we're, we're, we feel uh, really fortunate um, to have gotten a lot of feedback from members of our community along the way and uh, lots of suggestions for, well, are, are you going to also include this or have you thought about that topic in that way? And, that, and all of that uh, involvement from colleagues made the book better. Uh, it only made the book better. And um, the collaboration between Trisha and I also, we, we brought very different perspectives uh, to the writing of the book. And, and I think that also made it better. So let's start off with defining blame. If I'm saying lead without blame, what is it we're trying to avoid here? And this is the, um, this is the definitions that we came up with. Blame is uh, pointed at others, right? And often when we blame someone, if we're doing it intentionally, often happens in unintentionally. But when we're doing it intentionally, what we hope is happening is that those people will feel guilt or shame and that that will cause them to change how they do things. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't actually work that way. Um, it's um, well, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but blame and shame, it's, it's telling someone else they aren't good enough and then hoping they won't feel good enough and that that will somehow miraculously cause them to be better. Seems like a weird kind of reasoning, but there you have it, that's what we do. So what we know is that leaders have goals. Uh, leaders have worthy goals. They want to see customers satisfied. They want to uh, 
focus on business retention or, or growth and team engagement, helping teams perform better, you know, whatever the combination of these goals, most leaders have these in mind, whether it's a team leader or someone in the executive suite, you know, leaders that all named leaders at all levels of the organization have these kinds of goals. And even the informal leaders may will have them too. Whoops, backwards, let's go back. I have to, I, I can't hit this as quickly as I do. Okay, there we go, oops, all right. <laughs> Sorry, this, um, this is a new thing for me. So, but what we know from those goals is that leaders want to achieve results. That's what they tell us when we talk to, to leaders or, or when we interview ourselves and we're in leaders. Yes, I want to make sure that this conference gets put on. I, I want to make sure that I want to see my team um, delivering on a, some kind of a regular cadence. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that these things are happening. Yet when we are in leadership, we often miss opportunities that would really help our teams thrive in uncertainty and chaos. And the reason that's important, why we wanna be able to identify and take on those, um, those opportunities is because that has become the norm in our world, in our marketplace. Um, where new, new things are being thrown at us all the time, sometimes that we, in a way that we feel like we can't even keep up. So this is a quote from the book. There are a lot of quotes from the book and from other folks uh, scattered throughout this. So leaders also have honorable intentions, right? They want to help the business succeed. That's why they have those goals. They want to help their colleagues and their teams succeed. They want to help themselves succeed. Those are all honorable intentions. And we wrote this book for every courageous leader, all the people who are trying to put forward those honorable intentions, the ones who understand that success is, comes from creating places where others can do their best work, no matter the chaos, no matter the, the disruptions. So we know that. Um, and so this is not a book about blaming leaders who blame, uh, just to be clear about that. This is about helping folks achieve their intentions and achieve their goals in the best possible way. And what we know is that if we avoid blaming and shaming folks, we're more likely to get our results and reach our goals. So, but what we see a lot is that leaders get caught in a trap. Um, they have, there's a, and that's is true even today. Some of these quotes that you'll see from a while back, but even today, leaders still get caught in this trap of so much of what we call leadership and management work, Peter Drucker said decades ago, consists of making it difficult for people to work. You know, we think we need policies, we think we need procedures, we need with a lot of things that actually, particularly for folks who want to use an agile approach, just get in the way. So, and how do we learn that? Well, leaders tend to lead the way others led them. There aren't a lot of really good leadership programs out there that move beyond the sort of how to, how to keep your uh, dashboard updated and, and those kinds of things. Unfortunately, not all past or present leaders deserve emulation. And so bad habits get passed on, uh, bad leadership habits. Leadership have, and by bad, I mean leadership habits that don't get us the results we're after. So we wanna, this book is about helping people break free from those patterns and habits. So some of that breaking free is, is uh, understanding what are the fallacies that we're working on, what fallacies are causing us to have false assumptions about the best ways to lead. Uh, recently, I just recently subscribed to, this is a little personal story, I recently subscribed to Scientific American because I discovered 
what an awesome magazine it is. I didn't really know before. I thought it was dry and, and so on. But um, it, my, my father uh, did work in the 70s that he informed me the other day, you know, that my work is still out there working. And then I learned he had been working on the Voyager project. Uh, early in his career and never told any of us in the family about it, but they wrote an article about it in uh, Scientific American that that's still going forward. So I subscribed and, and in my most recent uh, edition, which came out just aug October, came out earlier this month, uh, it was this article when dominant leaders go wrong. And so these two people, Hemant Kakar and Nero Sivanathan, um, hope I didn't do, do that too badly. Um, they did a whole research project that's described in this issue of uh, Scientific American. And their conclusion was employees supervised by a dominant leader reported greater zero sum thinking. If you go forward in some way, it makes me go back. We can't, we can't both go forward, right? It's zero sum thinking. And as their supervisor subsequently revealed, these employees display fewer helping behaviors. They, they aren't collab, they, it works, a, that dominant leadership model works against them collaborating. And another quote, an assertive or forceful approach could reduce cohesiveness and collaboration in an organization. Well, that kind of assertive, a forceful, judgmental approach is exactly the, the profile of leading from blame, using blame as a leadership tool. So when we feel blamed by others or shamed by ourselves, we cripple our ability to perform well. So I'm a big believer in the retrospective prime directive that says, you know, no matter what we discover, we truly believe that everyone has done the best they can given their skills and abilities, the situation at hand, the information they had and the resources available to them, right? I believe that. And yet we often will get into situations where we are trying to blame other people in order to increase performance. When it's actually the system, the, the system that allowed us to put the wrong person in the wrong job or not give them the information and resources they need or expect certain kinds of performance, their best they can offer, but they showed up and they've got a cold today or, they, or they're, you know, there's problems at home that the rest of us don't know about. So when we start using blame to deal with those kinds of problems, instead of looking to how is the system contributing to that, we inhibit performance. So what's a leader to do? Well, what we came up with in uh, Tricia and I from work that she'd done and work I'd done and that we put together is this model that is um, called the four C's of learning leaders. And I wanna give you a little bit of information about that. Um, well, I've got it down here. Be, I got ahead of myself here. So, um, we, we believe this is what contributes, these are the behaviors, behaviors that exhibit these kinds of characteristics um, are the ones that contribute to leadership effectiveness. So leaders who show courage, who show compassion, who demonstrate their confidence and complexity. So just a little bit more about that. Courage has to do with what Chip Bell called leading out loud. Um, or learning out, I'm sorry, learning out loud. It's, it's being the person who is visible, leading and encouraging discovery, uh, you know, admitting that they don't have an answer for a problem and that, but that as a group, they could figure it out together. Um, those kinds of things, because, you know, we've expected leaders to have all the answers. We've expected leaders to be able to know it all, to, step up and have the courage to say, no, that's, 
that's not true. I can't possibly know it all. And I don't have all the answers, but I know that we can figure this out together. And here are the, here are the, the areas of learning that I'm working on for myself and you know, being willing to model that. And then compassion is, you know, just understanding that when we are in an environment where a lot of learning is needed, like the chaotic, uh, uncertain, ambiguous world that we're in, that learning is hard. And, and it often has a um, connects with fears that people have from school days or other times about when they were punished for the way they were learning or not learning. Um, and so in order to be a leader, when you're working with folks who come from that space, we need to be um, able to show them that we care and that we, we value their learning and, um, and that we have patience with them. So, um, and then confidence is that the leader shows that they actually have confidence that the people that they are leading, the teams or the individuals they're leading, have the ability to learn their way through whatever problem life throws at them. And that's where we get more toward resilience. And then finally, complexity. Leaders have to understand the complex nature of the, of the workplaces that we are in now and be able to communicate that effectively um, to, the, to their uh, direct reports, the people who are working, their, their colleagues, people who are working with them, so that we go into these situations with that systems thinking mindset. So Prisha and I also created this model, Leadership Through Learning. We uh, looked at what we found were kind of the critical few um, things that we needed to think about that those, you know, for the, where we needed to focus those four C's for the, for leaders. And we discovered um, some essential motivators and what we call resilience factors for teams that, that help if, if we keep our focus here along with um, where we're headed, it, we're more likely to um, be able to learn our way through any challenge. So um, the three motivators that are in the middle of that model are purpose, autonomy, and co-intelligence. Uh, you might even, purpose is about knowing what the work is and why we've been brought together to do the work and be focused on achieving that purpose as we, as we work together. Autonomy uh, motivates because it, we have agency. We feel like we can um, take, make decisions, take steps, um, and, and it helps us to own that, that purpose and to know that we want to achieve it. And then finally, co and those, these, those two may sound familiar to you because they're similar to Dan Pink's um, assertions around motivation for individuals. But we see these as motivating for teams in kind of a different way. And then finally, instead of mastery that Dan Pink talks about, we have co-intelligence, which is collective mastery that you would have in a team. You can't, none of us can have all the skills in for a complex solution. None of us can have all the perspectives and background and everything that's needed, but together, we can discover what we can do collectively and where we can find resources to fill in any gaps for that. So uh, these are all quotes from the book on this slide. And one of the, I like the one in the sidebar too, a lot, purpose and autonomy without co-intelligence, you, you get moving forward, but you don't get great quality. Purpose and co-intelligence without autonomy means you're dealing with lots of dependencies and bottlenecks. You, you have knowledge and you've got a purpose, but you don't have the, the agency for action. And then finally, co-intelligence and autonomy with no purpose means we do things just for the sake of doing things. So all three of these are essential to be present. And, and when leaders understand this, they can ensure that these are supported in the team's environment. 
And then the four resilience factors that were in that, that would form the, the little bit outer ring, um, it, it has to do with these four areas. The collaborative connection, really building trust, knowing we're a team together, knowing who we are as a team and, and um, honoring the fact that and respecting each other and so on. Um, individuating knowing who's on the team and why. Um, and then conflict resilience. Conflict is human. There's always going to be conflicts. And actually, conflicts are a great indicator. Um, I just heard uh, Tricia on a podcast today, and she said, conflicts means there's something trying to emerge. You know, you have an idea, I have an idea, they aren't the same idea. If we, if we, don't, if we don't just honor that, Oh, we're, we have a difference here. Let's let's work through it. Let's figure out why we why we don't want to take the same path. Often, a better third or fourth or fifth path will will show up. So it makes conflict doing conflict well makes space for that kind of emergence. And so we want to be able to do teams who can do that well. We also want inclusive collaboration. We want all those different areas of mastery, all those different backgrounds, all that, all the diversity to be able to show up and be welcomed and feel they belong so that, that you get true collaboration uh, among all of those differences because that makes everything we do stronger. And then uh, power dynamics, knowing how to deal with the powers in the room and the team in the organization, what you know? When do you? When does power over make sense? Not as often as we think, frankly. But when can we move to a more power with stance? And what kinds of power do we encounter? Um, all of those things are involved in the power dynamics resilience factor. So. That, uh, that and the idea that we believe that leaders are everywhere. I love this quote by Richard Sheridan. Uh, Diana and Tricia bring a wealth of experience, deep knowledge and practical ideas to courageous leaders everywhere, trying to break free of the baddest actors in the positive culture game. We've really focused in this book on uh, leaders at every level, leaders in all kinds of situations. This isn't just an agile book, though I think a lot of uh, effective agile leaders will find a lot of familiar themes and hopefully some other things that they want to polish up a little bit in their own behaviors. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so this, this is really the, the message that we want to bring. So I told you I'd show you this slide again, so you can make sure to get your uh, discount if you want it. That discount code comes off at uh, the publisher's Book, bookstore. So that's why, you know, write to us and we'll give you all the information that you need to um, get that discount and a free excerpt. And so with that, let's chat and see uh, what kinds of questions you have for me. Diana, I, have, you know I have my copy of the book right here. So <laughs> <laughs> Anything I don't remember, I can look up. So <laughs> there, have, there have been a whole pile of questions that folks have sent me through the chat. I've okay. tried to uh, summarize a few um, to, to get through. We are going to run out of time here, which is one okay. of those unfortunate things, but that's okay. Um, okay. This has been this has been a fantastic look into uh, into this topic and you know uh, certainly whet the appetite of folks based on the questions uh, to to get into the um, to get into the book a little bit more. But let me try and go through some of the the questions okay. that uh, the, the the more impactful ones here. The first one is around you talked around um, leaders following policies and procedures that are in place. Oh, and by the way, if you do have a question, throw it in the chat or just send me a direct message, um, and I'll try and get to as many as I can in the time we have. Uh, but you talked a little bit about policies and procedures um, that we we lead by following the, the rules. A lot of the performance management systems that we have in place reward those who follow the rules and do well in the system, not those who challenge the system and challenge the way of leaders. What advice right. would you have for those that are looking to change the way we lead? Um, well, you know, there... 
years ago there was I it, sometimes it's, sometimes it's we're told it's Martin Fowler or sometimes we're told it's somebody else um, that said you know if you really want to do agile well or if you really want to and so in this instance if you really want to lead well uh, you may need to change your organization or you might need to change your organization. So one of the things that we really wanna do is find a good environment to be able to do the kind of leadership we want. So I'm, I'll, I'll just put that out there and put it to the side because a lot of folks don't feel like they have the um, freedom to just go work somewhere else, even, even though right now is a good time for folks who do think that. Um, and what we do, I, I believe the best way is to, is to start in small ways, make small changes. Um, the, another book that actually fits very well with Trisha's in my book is Esther Derby's uh, Seven Rules for Positive and Productive Change. She talks very much there about taking that kind of an, kind of an incremental approach to making changes in the organization. And so if your organization, for instance, um, says it wants to embrace team-based work, but the HR department persists in doing individual performance reviews, for instance, um, and, and then sets up and then, and then do the kind of rank and yank, you know, the rating, rating people on their performance. And, you know, and when we know that really any time, but particularly when you're working at a team, you really can't extract one person's performance from another person's performance, but still asking for that data. Um, those are the kinds of things that we can as leaders, and, uh, and I include agile coaches and both enterprise agile coaches and team agile coaches, um, that we can begin to make visible to the organization the ways in which that gets in the way. Um, I always think that, you know, when I go into an organization to help make some kinds of change, actually, some of the big policy, the big, yeah, the big procedure and policy holders, maintainers um, are HR, finance, a lot of the staff roles. I go and make friends with those people as quickly as possible and, and ask them, will I be able to come and talk to you about how you can help us? help the organization. And uh, so, you know, small steps like that, um, we look for to make, to make change. And yes, it takes courage. And yes, it means that you have to understand the complexity of the organization. I mean, that, those are both tied to that, those four C's. But as you do these things, as you repeat this, these kinds of um, efforts to, to, make the organization more effective, you will see results. And um, unfortunately, if you really are threatening somebody's promotional possibilities, you might see results you don't like. But uh, that's actually, it still, if, if the intention is to make a better workplace, I believe it's worth doing. And so, um, yeah, so having the courage to do those things, to, to to make those policies and procedures visible, uh, to say, you know, JIRA is not helping our teams in these ways and it is slowing us down in these ways. And we have this JIRA specialist over here who can tell us how to use JIRA in ways that actually help us as opposed to trying to adopt everything. Um, Ainsley and I, when we were writing the liftoff book, used to, she used to talk about people, um, um, project managers in the PMO who would adopt everything in the PMBOK when right in the PMBOK, it says pick and choose, right? The things that are gonna be appropriate for your organization. And so uh, that's often the same, the same mindset that uses tools like JIRA. And, and I don't mean to pick on JIRA, but I'm using that as a sort of generic Kleenex sort of term, right? To those kinds of big dashboard things that there are ways to use those that can be helpful, but often we just adopt the whole thing and then half of it gets in our way. So we can make that stuff visible. 
There are a couple of more questions that I'd yeah. love to get to if it's all right. We're going to go a little bit long, and I know many of you may have to drop off, oh. and that's okay. You okay. can always watch the recording on our YouTube channel, or the Agile TO YouTube channel. Yeah. There's a link for that being posted in the chat right now. And if you're looking for more information or to connect with Diana after this call, um, her information is, uh, again, in the chat window as well. It's uh, it's easy enough for us to find Diana. But Diana, if you're good, um, I'd love to try and get uh, just just two more questions if okay. I possibly okay. can. Okay, I will try to I'll try to do short answers. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I don't know that these are these are short answer type questions. Yeah. But one okay. of them is around a lot of the things that you've been talking about require a safe environment for us to be able to do these different sorts of things in there. You've talked about now just talk getting out to some of the staff functions in other areas of the department. How do you create a safe environment for yeah, and I loved, by the way, and, and I think yeah. three, maybe four people posted notes in here uh, saying, Jeff, I love that. She called it out. Um, the <laughs> fact that managers don't come to work to do a bad job. They genuinely yeah. come to, yeah. like, they genuinely have positive intent in the work that they're doing. How do we create a safe environment for them to lead in a different right. way? Right. Well, I mean, that's kind of the point of the book. So there's a lot, uh, we have a lot of uh, suggestions in the book, I, more than I can so, sort of list out here. And it depends on what, what the question is around. But, but I think, you know, it's, it's where that four C's model comes from. Um, if we want, we can't wait around for somebody else to create the safe environment. That's where courage comes in. Um, and that's where compassion comes in because not everybody can step up and do that. And that's where knowing in your bones that if you really are to have a dedication to learning and can, can model that and, and encourage that in the people around you, that sort of spirit of inquiry and experimentation and learning that eventually we can learn our way through a lot of these problems. So um, it, it really is about starting with ourselves and, and, and looking for the allies. You know, who else in my organization is uncomfortable with the fact that we keep imposing this or that and, and you know, seeing that it inhibits our ability to deliver, but expecting some new result, even though we keep using it, you know, that old, that old saying. So you know, getting getting your allies together, uh, people who also want to see the organization get better results, and aren't um, and are willing to to step up and make that happen. Um, I think that's really important. And you know, whatever support or or supporters at home, you know, that say, you know, make your workplace better, and if you know, if you need to find a new job, I'll, I'll be patient or, you know, whatever, whatever it takes, um, looking for that support, you may have to create it for yourself. It may not show up at work to begin with, but as you, as more people see you be successful, more people are going to want what you've gotten at work and want to expand it. And then you can build on that. Very cool. Okay. The last question is something that uh, a bit of an anecdote that maybe we're hoping um, a couple of people mentioned, and I'm really curious about this one as well. Right off the top, you talked about one of the benefits of writing this book with a co-author, Trisha in this case, was that you came from different stances and had different perspectives yeah. on this topic to begin with. Right. I'm wondering if you can anecdotally in 30 seconds, share one thing that you learned from Trisha or one thing that she learned from you that you hadn't known two years ago when you started writing this book. Oh, wow. That's, that's a tough one. Um, now it's all so blended at this point, but, but I can talk about perspectives. I mean, there are a couple of things. G Trisha and I have a generational perspectives. Uh, I, I came up through a certain kind of work world and fought certain kind of battles, and she's done different ones. I came up through uh, government agencies and, uh, and some high tech, but more high tech manufacturing, where she's came more from, more from uh, tech on the software side. Um, the, the, she, I have been in a lot of leadership roles, but most recently, most of those roles have been um, um, in or in um, 
like nonprofit organizations or trade associations or starting a local meetup group or, you know, those kinds of things, right? Where she has had an experience actually being in that executive seat in a couple of different tech uh, companies. So we, there were just a lot of ways in which our perspectives different, differed, but our values were the same. And that's what made the difference. You know, we I, both wanted to see more humane workplaces and we both wanted to see <laughs> leaders get the compassion that they need in order for them to be able to be more effective. I love that. And I think, I hope those of you that were curious about the different perspectives that they brought, um, you, you know, it reminds me of the, the Agile Manifesto. Here are 17 guys who couldn't agree on what the right way to build software was, but they could agree on some principles and values. And it right. sounds, Diana, like you and Tricia had a very similar yeah. sort of conversation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. With this leadership one. Listen, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been this has been absolutely wonderful. The book is exceptional. Um, and so thank you both for writing it. And thank you for taking the time to share uh, a quick overview of it to hopefully introduce us to some of the highlights uh, uh, we can reflect on as we're reading through the, the book itself. So thank you again, Diana. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, look forward to connecting again. And for those of you that stuck with us on this call, thank you so much for joining. Um, really looking forward to next week. Next next week, next month, we're actually going to have uh, two uh, two more fantastic speakers, and they're going to do a quick talk on the stances of product leadership. We're going to keep that leadership theme going. So join us next month for the stances of product leadership. Thank you again for a fantastic evening tonight, and uh, and and uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday night. <laughs>